And good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. And uh, how are you? It's very good to be back with you. This is uh, John O'Loughlin, and we are on uh, McDuff Lives. Thanks for joining me, and thank you very much for uh, joining me for a very special evening. My uh, guest tonight is A.W. or Adam Finnegan, the author of the new book, The Sleeper Agent, The Rise of Lyme Disease, Chronic Illness, and the Great Imitator Antigens of Biological Warfare. And uh, Adam, I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, all I can say is thank you, thank you, thank you for writing this book. I'm, I, I think I said to you in an email that this is, to me, the most important book I've seen in a long time. And uh, I also told you that I'm a very slow reader, so I'll, I'll give you an update. I am now up to chapter uh, six. So there's a lot in this book, and uh, there's a lot in the footnotes, in the bibliography, and uh, the scholarship is evident on every page. Congratulations, Adam. Well, thank you for having me on here. It's a pleasure to be with you. And um, yeah, I, I, I think I would agree with you about that book because it's just, and you know, not, not to lionize myself, but just what is in that, the substance in that book is of such um far-reaching importance so it's great to it's great to get this information out well i took your uh suggestion yesterday when i said i i've got to start reading it i've got to got to put it on the show and uh skipped the first four chapters went into chapter five in order to uh focus on your work on eric Traub. Yeah, and, uh, I think, you know, if there's any one character that is the most uh, central to your story uh, that you've written here, the narrative, it's, uh, it is Eric Traub. Uh, so we started there, but I'll tell you, the first four chapters, the preface, everything, uh, John Loftus is a, a very, very kind introduction. Uh, I mean, you know, John Loftus is like a legend and uh, you've been able to work with him fairly closely. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, and actually, I'm going to be talking to him tomorrow, doing an interview with him, and uh, we've been, you know, corresponding through email back and forth since 2017 when we started, and about that, um, starting on chapter five, I actually was just kind of, ref <laughs> I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to have you start on chapter five. I was basically kind of saying for you before the interview, if you want to get like the most like up to date on the book, the most, most of the stuff is from chapter five onward, like a lot of, but, but actually you're right. I mean, John Loftus's interview and everything. So I kind of made a blunder with that. I didn't know that you were talking about reading it. So I was like, Oh yeah. No, so it was kind of <laughs> not at all because everybody's interested in Eric Traub. Um, yeah. He, you know, we've, we've been studying him here on McDuff lives for probably four years. Uh, just about every every book that uh, I that touches on the subject of Operation Paperclip, of course, will will uh, introduce him. And I've just finished reading uh, one of the less uh, known books on Paperclip called The Paperclip Conspiracy by Tom Bauer, a uh, a British writer uh, whose uh, angle on things really was enlightening. And uh, of course, Annie Jacobson's book, which I've just been through hundreds of times and dog dog eared and everything because. You know, in my case, uh, and I'm, I'm, I, I want you to read my book as soon as I can send you a copy. I, I, I'll get your address and send it to you because, you know, this is this involves my dad's career, and, and that that and that's what the fire in my belly is is to try to ex expose and understand uh, what what happened to him. But uh, in your case, uh, l l let me just read this little. Uh, um, um, short bio on the back cover of the sleeper agent uh, uh, so people can get a handle of where you uh, got started with this. A.W. Finnegan is a survivor of Lyme disease and immune tolerance, which we'll talk about and we can define that, and has, and has been battling health problems since he was young with the onset of a chronic disease in 2016. He is a writer, graphic artist, and designer, an avid reader and researcher of history, biological warfare, esoteric philosophy, spirituality, and the Western mystery traditions. He has made a special study of the life and works of Eric Traub and the science of immune tolerance. He has collected, 
and translated to English all of Traub's published research. He lives in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, peacefully by himself, where he enjoys BMX biking, fitness, study, the arts, and self-development. Well, it sounds idyllic. Uh, and uh, any, at, at any rate, you have you have uh, some ongoing uh, difficulties as a result of your exposure to uh, well to to the Lyme disease. And uh, if, if if that's uh, uh, if it's all right with you, just tell us a little bit about your personal experience. Yeah, so uh, my mother had Lyme disease. Um, so I was familiar with it. She got it in like 2000, I think, and got really sick for a number of years. So I was very familiar with it. And um, in 2000, I think it was like 2006, maybe, I read Lab 257. Mm -hmm. Um at a really low point in my life too. So, and, 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 um, I just, it stuck with me. Yeah. It stuck with me for a long time. And I always had like this, it was like this Trab character was a, was a very mysterious character to me. And, and I always kind of went back to him, like, who is this guy? I want to see more of this guy. And I, and I really felt like he was responsible with a Lyme disease um, thing, just intuitively, I felt that. But so fast forward to about 2016, I got sick with a chronic disease and I did get some tick bites. I may have had Lyme disease all my life because it can, it can remain dormant for a long time before activating. But I did get some tick bites and I got, I got sick, um, just like permanent headaches, uh, vertigo. I remember I was vomiting for a little bit, uh, but they were unusual headaches. They felt like headaches that I've never had before and just kind of defy. Like it's almost like my whole face is like numb. The upper part of my face is numb. And, and, and I just like, I have permanent headaches that don't go away. Like I've gotten used to it. So it's kind of like normal for me now, but in the beginning it was very tough. I got sick for a number of years, like incapacitated sick, and then kind of leveled out. And now I'm doing much better. Um, and, you know, I, I have, I eat a good diet and I get plenty of exercise and I try to live a balanced life. And I didn't, I didn't try to treat it with antibiotics heavily like a lot of people would do and i've known a lot of girls who, who tried that and got much much sicker so it was uh you know something that i just decided not to do and it, and, and a lot of lyme patients will drain their bank account trying to get well paying these doctors that charge you know ridiculous amounts of money but then they're just like experimenting. They don't even know really how to treat it. It's like, and, and they don't really know much about immune tolerance, which is a chronic immunosuppression. It's just another word for chronic immunosuppression um, or immune deficiency. That just, it's like continuous. And uh, so <clears throat> when that happened and I, and I realized I had Lyme disease, I, um, I went back to that Lab 257 book and I said, you know what? I want to figure this out. I want to figure this out. I started making this big timeline. Uh, it was called the Lyme disease and mycoplasma bioweapons timeline. And it was a really intricate timeline. It's still up. It was on a site I made called Operation um, Open Script. And uh, I ended up sending it to John Loftus. I ended up sending it to John Loftus on like Facebook or something. I didn't hear back from him for a long time. And then one day he, he, he responded and he thought that the timeline was amazing. And he's like, he gave me his number. He's like, give me a call. So I gave him a call and I was telling him, look, I want to write a book about this and I want to try to figure this out. And so, yeah, he, he's like, try to find as much as you can find on this Trav guy. And so we started corresponding. And then he's like, I'm also working with these film girls. They're interested in this Trav guy, two girls. Um, 
and he's like, why don't you also come on board and help them? And maybe they can also help you and getting some of the documents and, and things like that. So it was like a group of us, four of us, and they became very good friends of mine. One has been a screenwriter and has worked in Hollywood for a long time. The other one kind of puts the money up for the film projects. And that's like my friend Crystal. And, and she's been so helpful. I would not have been able to do this book if it was not for her help. So it was very synergistic. It was like I was able to help them because I was advising them on their screenplay about the same topic. And I was able to get an unbelievable amount of research with their help, you know, getting all of the insul reams work and, and just deciphering it all and being able to put the story together of what happened. So I advised them and it was very just, it was a very good project and it's still ongoing. But John Loftus was able to give me a lot of hints you know, from his sources, because he had sources, and he says in the beginning of the book how um, a lot of these people who had security clearances and worked in power defense wanted this information to be declassified because it was just, it was terrible what happened. And, and a lot of people can't really sit with that thinking, oh, you know, we're just going to keep this from the American public. So, they were going to loft this a lot because he had exposed a lot of the operation paperclip stuff in the, in the, on 60 minutes back in the eighties. And he brought out a lot of information and in his book back then it was called the Belarus secret. Now it's called America's Nazi secret. Um, he made an admission that the Lyme disease epidemic was started because of these Nazis that were brought over in Operation Paperclip. And he talking about ticks that were spreading this Lyme disease. And he said that the year before they even admitted that it was being spread by ticks. So when he made that admission, they had they haven't even they hadn't even confirmed that it was being spread by ticks. Hang and then on, the, hang, on hang on now. Who who made this who made this admission? John Loftus. And why do we why do we characterize it as an admission as opposed to uh, a uh, a public service or a, a, in other words was he an insider? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I mean you could say that he was saying it you know to get the information out. He was doing a patriotic deed. I I would say you know he was saying he said he said something like in the introduction before this before the intelligence people could edit my book or censor it, I was able to say, I was able to include that thing about Lyme disease being spread by ticks because of these Nazis that we brought over in Operation Paperclip. And he, and he meant Eric Traub. Um, and so that information came out in 1982. Um, he was saying it's spread by ticks. And then the year later, scientists confirmed that, yes, it's being spread by ticks. But then they said, but the, but the Plum, Plum Island experiments never happened. It was, it was a half lie. Like, yes, it's being spread by ticks, but the Plum Island thing never happened. But it did happen. It did happen. And um, my story, the, the book that I have kind of goes through that story. Basically... I was really um, motivated because John Loftus said something, I think, in that book about historians pasting together this. Uh, historians are going to have to paste this story together and it will be like pasting leaves um, back on a tree in the right order or something like that. It, it's something... And I was like really motivated to figure this story out. And I was like, I want to be the one. I want to I want to figure this thing out. So he was able to give me so many hints, and and you know it was it was like a, so much of what he said I could verify, and it was just it was great. And um, he was able to give me he he was just invaluable in this, just like those film girls. So it's a really awesome synergistic team we had going on.
And is there a film being produced? Well, they are working on a screenplay. I, I, I don't know if it would be a movie. Or I think they were talking about like a ne Netflix thing. A okay. series. Like a series, yeah. And the, the subjects would, would be um, uh, Lyme disease particularly or bio yes. bio warfare yep. generally. Yeah, and Traub, Eric Traub. Now, you were able to verify what John Loftus had hinted at by going through the documents that were collected uh, from Traub and that originated in wherever he was working, I guess. And, he, and as we know, he's worked in very different uh, uh, environments. Uh, you want to trace uh, his career for us just uh, so that we have an outline of where he where he started and where he ended up and how he got from one place to another? Certainly. So he starts out. So first, before he went into veterinary medicine, so he was a veterinarian, trained as a veterinarian, and veterinarians make excellent bioweaponeers because they know zoonosis. So first, though, he studied languages, and he got fluent, fluent in English and French. Um, and then... Um, he was acting as an interpreter for uh, Richard Richard E. Shope when he Richard E. Shope was over in at the University of Gießen, and he noticed that Eric Traub had a knack for virus research, and he said, "Oh, you should come study at the Rockefeller Institute." So Traub took him up on that offer, and he got a I believe it was a scholarship or something like that. Um, but he was able to go to the Rockefeller Institute. Uh, they took him over, and he worked from 1933, I believe it was, or 34, all the way to 1938. He was at the Rockefeller Institute. And, and while he was at the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Institute, he made some very big discoveries with a virus called lymphocytic chorea meningitis. So um, after 1938... He went back to Germany because of what was going on in the war. It was, things were really heating up. He went back and he took up professorship at the University of Gießen under a, a man named Dr. Carl Beller. And Carl, Carl Beller became his mentor. And it was Carl Beller who taught him all about the tick-borne diseases and, and things of that nature. And it was... What it, that was where Traub was when he acquired the spirochete that would become Lyme disease. So he was there, and then in 1942, he was drafted into the art. The, the he was drafted into military service for the Reich. He was only on the front lines in France for a little bit. They pulled him aside, they said, We don't want you to end up a casualty, so you're gonna go back and, and work in veterinary medicine and, and work on that, on that important work that you've been doing. Um, and so he, he, he worked, I believe, yeah, I think it was University of Gießen for a time back there, but then he went to a, um, an island which was like Germany's Plum Island called Insel Reims. And he became vice president of Insel Reims, and he was basically directing the entire phase of research for the whole facility. Otto Waldman, who was president, wasn't as involved. He was more like um, a bureaucrat kind of person. He was like always taking trips elsewhere. But Eric Traub basically ran Insel Reims from 1942 all the way to 1948 when he escaped. He did a lot of important work. He did a lot of uh, work on avian influenza and foot and mouth disease and um, also like swine polio and all sorts of other um, bio-warfare agents. Uh, and so... The Russians, the Soviet Union, captured Insel Reims, what was it, in 1945. And Joseph Stalin put this facility under his personal protection. It was a very um, 
important research facility. They knew that it was the leading research facility in the entire world. Um, for, and so that, for, for bioweapons, you mean? Yeah, and, and like virus research, and it was like the cutting edge because Germany was like the best of the best in, in the science stuff. And that facility, see, one of the reasons that agricultural facilities and, and such and veterinary problems or veterinary medicine um, became so important to biowarfare because it was, it was such a good cover and they could, they could work on all these animal diseases that, that they were turning into human pathogens and it would all be covered. You know, people would say, oh, they just work with foot and mouth disease, you know. Um, but what happened was they were turning things like foot and mouth disease into human pathogens as they were making it neurotropic, which means it takes to the central nervous system and brain, so it changes its properties. They were taking animal diseases and turning them into human diseases. And it made such a good cover. And a lot of the reason why biowarfare is hidden under covers is because nobody wants to end up like Germany was in the First World War. They used chemical weapons and biological weapons, and they got an unbelievable number of sanctions from the League of Nations, and it crippled Germany's economy. And it was like the pretext for the rise of the Third Reich. So, and, you know, they finished paying off their debt in like 2012 for what happened in um, World War One. It took them 92 years to pay off the debt for those reparations. And so nobody wanted to be the next Germany. So they, like by proxy, all bioweapons research is hidden under covers like medicine, cancer research, and especially animal disease. So... Eric Traub escaped. He, he was under Russian control from 1945 to 1948, um, and he made a so-called escape, but it wasn't really an escape. He was a he. It looks like at that time they they may have blackmailed him. I'm pretty sure they did blackmail him with war crimes because you know Insul Reims did have forced labor there and and. Traub was working on these influenza vaccines, avian influenza, human va influenza vaccines. And so they were probably testing it on people and there were probably deaths. And so it looks like the Russians had blackmailed Traub and said, you know, probably said, you can work for us or you can go to Nuremberg. Um, and so they set up with the uh, Soviet moles in the MI6, Donald McLean, he facilitated Traub's escape. And so Traub escaped. He went to West Germany. And then this was 1948. Um, he, he sat in some of the camps there for a while. And they're like, you're going to go to the United States. You, you, can, you can work for the Navy at the United States. So in 1949... He went to um, Bethesda, Maryland to work at NMRI or the Naval Medical Research Institute. And that is where, and he brought cultures with him. And so he started to, they basically put him at like the top of the bioweapons program because he was so knowledgeable. He knew more than all of those people. And they knew how important he was, but they did what they didn't know was that he was a Soviet double agent for the KGB at that time, and he was sent over to attack us. Um, they put him on the top of the biological warfare program, so he was named in the uh, in the in the files as a supervisory bacteriologist. So he was supervising a lot of these what are called simulant tests or simulation tests where they would take what were thought harmless microbes and spray them all over the place and then see how they spread out. And of course, in San Francisco, there were a number of deaths and people who became sick with these, these bacteria that they were spreading all over the place. There was one called Serratia marcosins and it caused a death in San Francisco and a 
a bunch of people were hospitalized with very resistant infections. And I can show that he weaponized that bacteria back in Germany. Um, so it seems these microbes that they were spraying all over the place weren't so harmless. And then they were also doing these simulation tests with insects. So they would, they would attach ticks on birds and such. And it was said that there was a harmless tracer bacteria in them. They would release them. And that's why they were doing that on Plum Island. They were releasing ticks on birds. Like the people, the, the, the military facilitating it were like idiots just thinking, oh, this is just a harmless experiment. We can just see how these ticks spread out. Because back then, the black-legged tick, and the black-legged tick is the number one tick that spreads Lyme disease and all of those nasty infections. Back at that time, that tick was said to not have any, it did not, it did not transmit any human diseases back then. So it was an excellent tick to use back then for them in their minds. And Traub put a cocktail of diseases into these ticks. And he told them something like, oh, um, a bullseye rash is how back in Germany we, we tracked how these things spread out. And it was harmless. It, it's, don't worry about it. It's not, it's not anything to worry about. It's, harm, it's a harmless. bullseye yeah. rash? Yeah. Wow. So they kind of listen, listen to They listened to him. And they trusted him. And he was just like, so he was doing all this stuff and he was attacking us left and right. He was going back and forth between um, the eastern United States and Bogota, Colombia um, for the FAO. So when he was sent over here, he was also working for the FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture organization which is like it's a it's a un organization like the world health organization but it's for agriculture and so when he came over he was working for them and that gave him diplomatic immunity oh boy. which means he's he can avoid prosecution for doing things i mean it's not it's not always around with him too right he can carry a nice uh, diplomatic pouch and yeah uh, not you know please don't check my bags mr customs man yeah and he was he was smuggling called undeclared cultures um he was having cultures sent to him in bogota from from some of his insulreams colleagues um and and it was funny because he he would as the and i and i used this graph that showed the migration of birds he would he would go down to bogota colombia as the birds were flying south, right? He would go down there for the, when the birds would fly south. And then the months that they fly back up north, he would come back up north. So they had this like avian, this bird program and like an insect vector program, tick program or arthropod um, program where they, where they could do these simulant tests and, and they would see how far it spreads out. And so and that, what happened was, so Donald McLean, the guy who got him over here, he had disappeared from the ranks in MI6 and defected to Russia. And I think not long after that, Kim Philby, which they were part of the Cambridge five spies, but so it, it caused a lot of commotion. It caused a lot of suspicion when Donald McLean was, when they found out that he, he defected to the Soviet Union and was a double agent, and he had so many of our secrets. Um, so many. It was a major compromise. And um, Eric Traub was, was offered to lead Plum Island many times, but he was always declining the offer, declining the offer. And because obviously, so it, it would have meant a, a serious background check to get that position. 
because he would have a security clearance if he did that. And he avoided it. He didn't want to do that. So he kept turning it down. And, and so it aroused the suspicion of the intelligence, Western intelligence, American intelligence. And so eventually... Um, one, this this counterintelligence corps guy, Dan, uh, Dan Benjamin, the CIC, uh, he interrogated Eric Schaub, and he was a friend of John Loftus. John Loftus knew him, and he interrogated Eric Schaub personally, tripped him up in a lie, um, because there are all these contradictions in his story. And then he said something like, do you have anything you want to say before I hand you over uh, as a as a so as a spy of the KGB for sentencing? And then it was a bluff, but he he broke down and decided to confess. And he said, "Yeah, I I'm a, I I was sent over here for the KGB. I was, you know, they told me what I had to do, but he said I wasn't activated yet and I was just trying to, I, I turned down the positions to keep a low profile so they wouldn't bother with a little guy like me, even though he was the most important guy we had over here. And the documents confirm that it said that he was a top rate scientist that could not be replaced by anyone in the United States, him and his lab tech and Berger and Berger never made it over to the United States, but her file, she was approved and everything. But she stayed in Germany, and her file shows that Eric Traub was going to be working on rickettsia and viruses, and and so he's tied to these tick-borne diseases. And um, but the his file and her file, their approval both said these people are the best of the best. They cannot be replaced by anybody in the United States. They are the only ones qualified to handle these pathogens. And that Ann Berger was, was going to be doing all the harvesting procedures alone because she was the only one qualified enough or skilled enough to not get infected. And um, so they, like, designed... They... They did a lot of weaponizing. Well, actually, not they. Eric Traub did a lot of weaponizing a lot of these agents, like it said in her file, and um, made them very made them much more infectious. And these part of these were were used in North Korea as bioweapons that uh, that the Americans, British, and Canadians used against the North against North Korea and the Korean War. Um, so and that became a scandal because you know the American Western intelligence just tried to deny it and say that it was propaganda, but it was problematic because the people, the the pilots that were shot down had had all confessed to doing it. And um, so there was this was a big problem and then that, when that's, Trump, when, uh, that's when Alan Dulles comes comes up with the idea of brainwashing, and, and he, yeah, exactly he puts, puts out through his mighty Wurlitzer public, you know, his uh, his his organ of of uh, public information that oh, these pilots were brainwashed, and that yeah. gives the ability now to say to 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 the public now we've got to study all this brainwashing, and boy, did they. Absolutely. That was the event. You're right. That was the event that started all of that MK Ultra research um, because they, they, they tried to deny it by saying, yeah, they were brainwashed and, and told to say this. Um, so when Trump confessed, um, he had this diplomatic immunity and Agent Dan Benjamin was like, we should prosecute him to the fullest extent. And they, and um, the, I think it was the Eisenhower administration at the time. I can't remember, but they, they, they accepted Traub's dubious explanation. And, but they said, well, if he's going to be, 
he should be fired from all his American work and sent back to Germany. And that's what happened. So he didn't just pack up and go home. He was sent back because of this incident, but nobody was ever told that. And, and, and the funny thing was, is that it did not stop him from coming back to America numerous times um, for, for conferences to attend um, Plum Island conferences, uh, virus, con you know, conferences on virus research, all sorts of things. And it did not stop um, him. So he went over to head another bioweapons lab or a lab in West Germany um, for animal disease. And they were sending him viruses left and right. So, so he was still being sent dangerous pathogens, even though he was a, he was a Soviet double agent. Um, they kept them under surveillance for most of his life for the rest of his life at that time after that whole confession. Uh, but it did not stop him. And he was, he was running amok over in West Germany because eventually uh, he had an entire embezzlement investigation opened for him and his vice president. His vice president was just out of control. He was an out of control drunk and just, they were, they were using money for, for things like they were, there was a lot of fraud going on and they were using the money for other things and such. And, so it was a disaster. It was like an animal house and they were like going out drinking and stuff and having like going to like strip clubs and getting involved with these, these ladies and stuff. I, I mean, it's kind of crazy. I, I included a quote about that in the later chapter, but so an embezzlement was it, an embezzlement investigation was opened against them and it lasted from like 1950, 1950, Eight to 1960, and Traub had charges against him. He avoided going to prison for two months and paid a hefty fine, but he was fired. He stepped down from that virus um, facility. He stepped down from that animal disease facility. Um, and I have the entire embezzlement investigation. It's pretty crazy. It, it, letting this guy just run amok after all that had already gone down. And then he went to Iran. He went to Iran for the FAO, for the UN. And he was helping some guys working on foot and mouth disease. And he, he said something, and I, I included a quote in the later in the book about him saying how pleasant or how rewarding and, and nice it was to see foot and mouth disease spreading freely among the cattle, despite mass vaccination and, you know, whatever else and, uh, and sanitary measures like, like it was his bioweapon spreading freely or something. And he was glad to see it spreading freely. <laughs> but, um, so he was at the FAO for a while. And I actually, I emailed one of the guys that he was training there and I, I, I pretended to be a doctor because I had my, I was at, like in community college. So like I had a, I had a school email and I, <laughs> or, or maybe I just pretended to be in science or something. And I said, Oh, you worked with Dr. Traub. What was that like? And stuff. And he just said, it was awesome. Cause I asked him what he was like. He's like, well, he was calm and you know, it seemed like he was giving me a, a, a bogus and a, like a bad answer, like an untruthful answer because apparently he had, he was like a very, he had an anger problem and like he, he, he was, he was like a very, Poor he would have Dr. Trump. Yeah. Oh. And, um, so he was at he was at Iran for a while. Then he came back and I think he studied I think he spent the rest of his career in Munich, the University of Munich, and um then in nineteen eighty five he passed away in his sleep. 
So he he had a long career and he worked for several superpowers. And you know, he helped Colombia, he helped Iran. Um, he worked for the Soviet Union. He worked for the uh, USA. He wore many hats during his life because he was the VIP. He was the guy who was the most skilled and the most knowledgeable and the most talented when it came to biological warfare. Sounds he like would, the time he was in Iran uh, was under the Shah, too, which, you know, that's a pretty dark regime. Yes. Um, and he was teaching, I could see that he was teaching them weaponization techniques. And there are some, some papers during his time in Iran that are, are just like almost blatant. He's talking about how to, you know, he could adapt a pathogen to any animal or species or human. Uh, he could he could raise the virulence. He could do all sorts of things, and he laid it out in this one paper how he could do all these things, and it was like wow. And he was teaching people how to adapt some of the rickettsia uh, to different animals with viruses using virus viruses and their proteins, and so he he was just like on a different level altogether. He, he was like functioning on a higher intelligence, but it was a, a, a lot less moral. It was like, you could say he was like an evil genius. And his, his papers are very hard to decipher at first, you know, like, cause he speaks, he speaks in that way that is very, a person who has a very high intellect and says things in a very vague manner, kind of like you see the globalists uh, writing books, how they say things, they'll say things that are um, pretty damning, but they'll say it in a way that doesn't look like they're saying what they're saying. You know what I mean? Double speak. Kind of like that. It's like, yeah. You have to read. Sometimes you have to read the sentence over a few times to see what he's actually saying, because it's almost like he's talking just to be intellectual and say it in a way that's hard to decipher. And he probably was because he was talking about bioweapons research. So he's at the same time he's trying to cover for himself, but then say what he he found in his research, but in a way that is like okay. Only a person who has any knowledge in bioweapons will be able to decipher what he's saying here. Um, so I, I collected all of his research, and I spent years studying his work. I became so interested because there was just so much mystery around him, and especially this whole Plum Island incident, and it, and it just, I just felt called to research it. And so I was, like, determined to find all his published work, Anything I could find on him, I was getting. And I got all of his German research, and I, and I translated all of it. And there was like, it was always like in one paper, you find a, bits and pieces of information that were very important. And so I was able to kind of paste the story together. Um, and it was, it was a monumental task, definitely. It took, took me six years of hard work to write that book. And, and thousands of hours. And, uh, it, you know, uh, folks, this story is unbelievable, except for it's real. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I haven't finished the book, but I'll tell you, uh, the, the footnotes are there. Uh, the research has been done. And uh, the narrative uh, flows uh, very, 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 very well. Um, and, you know, so tonight we've gone over some of the uh, – important points about uh, Lyme disease, about Dr. Traub, uh, and about the, the Soviet uh, effort to uh, injure America. And so a, a couple of, one, one, little inc one, one little incident, if you would, remember uh, in, in, the, in the book I read about how uh, Traub got the spirochete for Lyme disease, and it involved a psychologist. Could you tell that story? Yeah, um, I've, uh, Franz, Franz 
I think is it is it Hanel, J A H N E L. How how would you say that? Yeah, in German, Hanel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Franz Hanel. So back then, um, spirochetosis, like diseases like syphilis or relapsing fever, anything like spirochete stuff, uh, spirochete infections were actually studied under psychology because these things were neurotropic. That meant that they took to the brain and central nervous system. And when they do that, they cause all sorts of mental problems and neurological problems and mental problems because, as you know, it's attacking the brain. And so back then, it was rightfully classed. And I would imagine a lot of people... And, and that's actually one of the, the tenets of my book is that a lot of these agents are causing mental illnesses because they are neurotropic and they take to the brain and central nervous system. But it's all classed under disorders, syndromes. It's like they completely wipe the infectious uh, etiology out of it. They, they remove that part. But back then in Germany, um, they classified... These things were, were studied under psychology. So Franz Hanel had a had one of the strains of of relapsing fever or, or Borrelia, which came from birds. It was called back then Spirochyta gallinarum, but it was the same as it was later changed to Borrelia anserina. And that is the parent strain that gave rise to the three strains of Lyme disease, which in the European uh, continent, it, the, the strains were Borrelia afzelii, Borrelia garinii. And so these were like some of the earlier test runs. He was developing the weapon like over the years. So they were different kind of strains. And then Borrelia burgdorferi is the American strain. Um, and it eventually got to Europe too, but um, so I was able to show that his. So his, the student he had under him, Werner Schaefer, um, got a strain of this spirochete by Franz Hanel, and he was saying how I need to bring it back to the institute, which he was under Eric Traub at the time, so he would have given it to him, and that puts Eric Traub in the possession of these spirochetes. And then what I have is that that same year that he acquired that, uh, his mentor, Carl Beller, taught him all about uh, rickettsia, all of the co-infections that are common in Lyme disease. So that cocktail of um, infections that people often get, because most people don't just get Lyme disease. They get things like Babesia. They get Bartonella. They get... Um, Ehrlichiosis, or a lot of times it's called human monocytic ehrlichiosis, but ehrlichiosis. Um, what else? But those are those are the main ones, uh, and I show that he was taught all about those that year, and he was specifically taught about a complex disease that occurred in dogs when they had a mix of infections, and he named Babesia, Bartonella. Ehrlichia or rickettsia, and then he named this this parasite. Um, I think it's called Leishmaniasis or something like that. It's, it's kind of hard. It looks hard to pronounce, but I think that's how you say it. And uh, he was also shown that occasionally hard body ticks could transmit spirochetes, and it was always thought that they couldn't. But he he basically learned. All of this stuff, the same year he acquired that spirochete, and that's when he was able to, because what he, what he showed, what Carl Beller showed him was that when you have these complex, a, a number of infections all in one, it creates that same immune tolerance that Eric Traub discovered in 1936 with lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus. He noticed that uh, create this chronic immunosuppressive disease that lacks antibodies and lacks uh, noticeable inflammation, even though they're being attacked by all these um, infections. 
And that was a big deal because that's what gave it the stealth. That's what made it so that it was so that they'd be tested for things, but the test would come back negative because they didn't have any antibodies and, and we go by antibodies and then they didn't have any noticeable inflammation. So if you go get a scan or something, even though it feels like your head's being crushed, they're not going to see anything. So that was a big deal. And the weapons that he was trying to make were not fatal. It, it, the goal was not to have fatal weapons. The goal was to have weapons that would tire and exhaust, like keep people alive, but keep them so worn out that they can't contribute to society. They become a burden on the, on the public health system. And when you have a massive number of people like that, it creates havoc. So it, it's, it's almost better to keep people alive but keep them so worn out, and you know, um, it, it's, not, it's like a, it's like leaving a lot of wounded men on the battlefield, and the, the, all the other soldiers are going to have to deal with that somehow, and then it just slows slows them them down, you know. Except for, it's nothing about uh, you know the the. There's no glory and honor like a battlefield. There's no General Grant or General Lee. It's all uh, stealth. It's all directed at innocent human civilian people of all ages, and uh, it is an attack upon uh, a population. And so now you're 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 giving us so much new information. And I, I think someone in the chat said, "Hey, I I didn't know Eric Traub was a double agent." Well, I didn't know it either, you know. And I've read four or five books in, in which he's he's mentioned. And yet, uh, if you look at the state of our nation and the world today and, and uh, compare it with the, the narrative you've written, it certainly does ring true. And, and then that, you know, a lot of people are, I mean, I've heard it expressed that, oh, you know, Lyme disease, how are we ever going to find out, you know, where that came from? Well, you've given us a a, a very, uh, I'd say, a, a watertight hypothesis that it was a weapon, and during uh, and, and that Eric Traub was flipped during the time he was uh, under the control of Joseph Stalin. Yeah, I mean, who, who wouldn't be? You know, <laughs> Joseph Stalin yeah. says you'll do this. You damn well going to do it, or you're going to be in very very bad uh, shape. So, yeah. uh, so he comes over here. And 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 we start having all of these problems, and you know, the 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 idea that you know we've been under attack, you know, ever since 1945, I'm starting I'm starting to realize it. It's it, 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 it's not just biological either. It's psychological. It's all kinds of of, of vectors against us. But wow, we. we with 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 what you've done here, it's 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 going to be undeniable. People are going to have you know people that say, well, we'll never find out where Lyme disease come from. Well, you're going to have to go through this book first before you're going to get away of saying that because th this there is chapter and verse and and citations on every single uh, point that you make. It's a yep. tremendous effort, and I am so grateful to you, uh, Adam, for for spending some time with us here on McDuff Lives to. To get familiar with you and and to start digging into this book, uh, um, will you come back and tell us some more? Absolutely, yeah. I had a great time talking. Definitely, <laughs> it's it's been a pleasure and uh, and an honor. I, I once again I say this this book is going to redefine uh, uh, history, and uh, that's 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 what I that's what I say, and I think other people are going to find that uh, they have to agree. It's a fantastic work. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for being with us tonight. Uh, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., I'll be right here for an open chat. So if you have anything you'd like to talk about, we'll bring it and we'll dig into it together. Good night, Adam Finnegan. And uh, by the way, you have a website uh, and uh, people can get your book at Amazon. I want to make sure and, and say that. So uh, give us the uh, contact for getting in touch with you and, and learning more about your work. Yeah, um, thesleeperagent.com. So thesleeperagent.com is the website. 
And if you go under um, author page, there is an email address. Uh, that's where I can be contacted. And um, yeah, I, I thank you so much for having me on. I, I was a it was a very good discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I would love to talk again. And by the way, let's uh, put in a word for our good friend Matthew Raymer, who who was kind enough to uh, put us in touch with each other. And he provided me a copy of your book. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And uh, uh, Matthew runs the, the business content safe. You may see his, uh, his logo on my uh, archive where he uh, is just about daily republishing some of my old work that was taken down by you know who, YouTube. Oh yeah, All I right. had that problem too. All right, everybody, good night. Good night.